Good evening, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Hi there, hi there. You've got more comfortable chairs than my last audience. Yeah. Um, right, I'm a solicitor at Borough Harding and Rowe, and one of my practice areas is employment law. This evening, I'd like to talk to you about some important changes that have arisen and are to arise in employment law. I think this information may be useful to you. What I will say is that according to research, the time spent dealing with conflict in the workplace costs the UK economy £24 billion a year. Even so, employment law can seem a pretty dry subject. However, let's try describing employment law as something else. Let's think of employment law in terms of human interaction because human interaction is much more interesting and seems more relevant. People should obviously pursue happiness. And let's face it, happy people do tend to work more efficiently. There can be very few things as damaging to a business as a breakdown in relations between the employee and the employer. It can be extremely stressful for all of those involved. Thankfully, I think it is human nature that most people try to avoid conflict. And of course, we want to retain staff with experience. When it all goes wrong, it damages productivity, creativity, and above all, happiness. However, how do you prevent the vexatious litigator? As an employer, what do you do about the vexatious serial litigators out there? Well, here is a copy of last week's Law Gazette. We have, among other things, a three-page article about stress, depression and alcohol abuse in the legal profession. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> a report about a Mr. Anthony Bentley. Mr. Bentley began 31 different sets of employment tribunal proceedings over a period of 28 months. 31 claims from one man. Wow. To put that in context, that's an average of a little over one claim a month. Mr. Bentley has been told by the EAT, the Employment Appeal Tribunal, that he cannot bring any more cases in the tribunal. The annoying thing for an employer is that these claims have to be defended and that it's costly in terms of both your time and your money. You're probably aware and indeed quite relieved if you're an employer uh, that employees don't generally bring quite as many cases to the employment tribunal as Mr Bentley. But vexatious litigation is still a problem. And this particular issue is something that the government have been taking a great interest in recently. And well, you may have come across reference to the Enterprise and Regulatory Reform Bill. According to the Business Secretary, <laughs> Vince Cable, the Enterprise and Regulatory Reform Bill will improve our tribunals, scrap unnecessary red tape, and help ensure that people who work hard and do the right thing are rewarded. Well, that sounds very encouraging. And there are lots of very interesting changes. Some of these changes are in a consultation process, but others have arrived. I'm going to attempt to navigate with a sufficient degree of clarity through the biggest and most relevant changes. Perhaps the most well-publicised change is that as of the 6th of April 2012, the qualifying period for unfair dismissal increased from one to two years. The change applies to any employment contract entered into from the 6th of April, and the change is not retrospective. It increases the qualifying period required to bring a claim for unfair dismissal or request a written statement of reasons for dismissal to two years for those starting a new job on or after the 6th of April 2012. Now, I anticipate that this change will bring about a fall in the number of tribunal claims. Employers 
will have a longer period of time in which to conclude whether or not an employee is up to scratch. And in this terribly long recession, it may have the intended consequence of encouraging employers to hire more staff. The downside, potentially, and this is questionable, the downside is that it may discourage employees from moving jobs. The introduction of employment tribunal issue fees may also reduce the number of claims. Now, lawyers tend to have quite strong opinions about this particular proposal, uh, of course, depending on whether they represent employers or employees. And um, as I represent both, I'm, I'm going to sit on the fence. But um, I suspect that employment tribunals will become like county courts, where issue fees are standard and indeed linked to the value of the claim. I think we're probably going to have issue fees and hearing fees payable by the employee claimant of typically upwards of £400 for issuing a claim in the employment tribunal and £1,000 for the hearing fee. So bear in mind at the moment, we don't have any such fees at all, but these are quite likely to be introduced. Well, whatever the rights or wrongs of these fees, I suspect that they will be sufficient to put off many claimants. There has already been, as of the 6th of April, an increase in deposit orders. Uh, they've increased from £500 to £1,000. Now, let me explain. These deposit orders are made by the tribunal judge at quite an early stage of proceedings, um, quite, quite often several months before the hearing date, if they consider that the claimant has poor prospects of success or, or, or not particularly good prospects of success. Now, I have to say that the deposit orders do tend to focus the mind of the claimant. And, well, a further £1,000 on top of the hearing fee and the issue fee adds up to quite a considerable sum. These orders at the moment are not currently used as often as one would expect, but I think that that may well change due to public policy. Following on from and closely linked to the use of deposit orders are cost orders where the loser in the employment tribunal has to pay some of the winner's costs or, or perhaps even all of the winner's costs. These are not often used in the employment tribunal, but again, that may change due to public policy. Now, as of the 6th of April, the maximum amount of a cost order increased from £10,000 to £20,000. And again, I think this is another measure designed to satisfy business. Well, another change will be the anticipated introduction of mandatory pre-employment claim ACAS conciliation. If this is introduced, it's going to impose an obligation on prospective claimants to submit details of their claim to ACAS. Now, the point is that ACAS will try and achieve settlement within a prescribed period, and if the conciliation officer concludes that a settlement is not possible, or the prescribed period expires without a settlement, then the ACAS officer issues a certificate to the prospective claimant. Without a certificate, the claim cannot be lodged in the employment tribunal. Well, this is probably a constructive change, as I think it's possibly going to enable the parties to try and sort things out before incurring the considerable legal costs. The downside is that it's going to put a tremendous strain on ACAS in terms of manpower, and, well, there's a risk that it could become a tick box exercise. Procedurally, an interesting change has been the amendment allowing, unless the judge directs otherwise, witness statements to be taken as read in the employment tribunal rather than requiring the witnesses to attend the hearings. Um, and I think this should benefit the employer as it will avoid the inconvenience to the employer in terms of lost working hours. The political question, and lawyers at the moment are incredibly interested in what, well, we're in fact nervous about what politicians have to say, is whether the government will go ahead and take many of these steps or whether the consultation and discussions are simply part of an overall effort to improve business confidence. The market or business confidence theory was something that some people had thought, had thought about the use of financial cuts generally from 2010, but I think they've been proven wrong and the cuts are being implemented. I don't think it's much of a secret that, that Vince Cable has been uncomfortable with some of this policy making and I think you must agree 
but uh, that Vince does do uh, looking uncomfortable about things very well indeed. He's just got that expression. It's very good. Um, you may have come across reference to the Beecroft report, which was leaked a little while ago. Vince Cable decided not to appear in the Commons uh, when this report's recommendations were debated last month. Beecroft had recommended compensated no-fault dismissal. That is, to dismiss a worker where no fault is identified on the worker's part by paying a set amount of compensation. He'd also recommended exemptions from unfair dismissal law for small businesses with fewer than 10 employees. Well, I think some of this may happen regardless of Vince's discomfort. Anyway, what can we take away from all of this? The government show an intention to try and increase business confidence and to respond to the perception that employees have been holding all the good cards and causing employers a great deal of inconvenience. Well, that's interesting, and I'd, I'd like to hear your views on that particular perception. But consider this, the Employment Lawyers Association report that the actual number of claims in the Employment Tribunal has been falling for over a year or so. There has been something in the order of a 25% drop in the number of tribunal claims over the last couple of years, and this runs quite contrary to the public perception. If there's a change in government, well, some of the changes I mentioned may be amended, uh, but I suspect that not many of the changes will be reversed. I think there'll be some posturing, but a general consensus against reversal. I think from a financial perspective, the issue fees and the hearing fees are going to be a much uh, needed revenue uh, for the cost of running the Employment Tribunal. Uh, anyway, this is all, or some of it is possibly very interesting to you, but um, from your perspective, whether as an employer or an employee, the important thing is the prevention of claims through having a happy workplace. If you're an employer, well, the system does seem to be changing to your advantage. But I must stress, don't rely on these changes. It has got to be better to avoid the risk of a potential claim. For happiness, for successful human interaction, everyone in the workplace should know the rules. This means making sure that employment contracts are in place. <coughs> with up-to-date terms and conditions dealing with issues such as mobile phone use during working hours and the use and misuse of Facebook and Twitter. Uh, I think you'll agree that Facebook and Twitter have their place in marketing but you don't want to have your employees wasting time on their iPhones during working hours. Well, I'd always recommend and encourage a regular review of office manuals and operating procedures, as, of course, they do need to change with the times. I'll say this, after all, despite the falling numbers claiming in the employment tribunal, there were still about 200,000 claims last year. Anyway, I'd like to thank you for listening, and if anyone's got any comments or questions, then please... Far away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.